ஏன்னா அறிஞர் சூழ்நிலை ஹலோ டாக்டர் ஆலிமி குட் ஆஃப்டர்நூன்மா குட் ஆஃப்டர்நூன்மா குட் ஆஃப்டர்நூன்மா யா குட் ஆஃப்டர்நூன் ஹவ் ஆர் யூ ஆர் வெரி மச் थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच नाइस टू सी यू कैन यू सी यस आई कैन आई कैन सी यू Good afternoon everyone. Yes, ma'am. I can see you, ma'am. So I just want to wait for a bit then I can let it uh, people in. Um so in another 6 minutes it will be 2:30. So we'll see how many people we have. Sometimes we have to give an extra half, maybe 5 minutes just to let more people in. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay. I have an appointment by 3:34. right so okay over by then this ideally should be um a one hour session i i saw one of the questions that had already been asked okay. you know and come up with an allotment so if the answers are brief and concise we we can move quickly through them maybe we might have three four five extra questions asked either through youtube because we're streaming sure. youtube or on the whatsapp platform mm-hmm. that's why i grouped the questions together i just sent you an updated list and a lot of questions are sort of team around the same pathology so that's why i grouped them together so i intend to ask those questions all at the same time under the same theme just to make it faster okay thank you ma all right i'll just switch off my video then until we are ready okay ma okay ma thank you Hello ma Hello, Salam Alaikum. Alaikum Salam. Yeah, how are you? I'm fine, ma'am. Yeah, I, I've st- I've given you, I've sent you the two um PowerPoint presentations. Have you seen them? Yes, I have seen them. Right. So if I happen to have a glitch, because network is up and down here, then you'll just okay. take over. Yes, you but to... your volume is so low. I wonder, is it from my hand? Hello, Salam Alaikum. Why is your volume? Is... Yeah, how are you? I'm fine, ma'am. Yeah. I've st- I've given you I've sent you the two um PowerPoint presentations. Have you seen them? Yes, I have seen them. Right. So, if I happen to have a glitch cuz network is up and down here, then you're just okay. taking over. Okay. Yes, but your volume is so low. Yeah, I wonder is it from my hand? Bring it. Sorry. You already have it set and set down. Thank you. 
Um, hello, everybody. Hello, good afternoon. Can you yeah. all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, good afternoon. We could hear. You can hear. You. 
points. I'm just going to give it another two or three minutes and then we can start because we're aware that you know people have th other things to do. Um, we're also live streaming on YouTube. So probably there'll be other people watching from the YouTube um, end of things. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Halima Alimi. I'm the Executive Director, Restore Foundation for Child Sight. Um, this afternoon, um, we'll have our another public education webinar, which the foundation undertakes from time to time for the purpose of educating the public. Today is a unique one where we have our sixth um, 
public education webinar as a Q&A, a question and answer session, a unique opportunity for the public to ask experts in childcare questions that you know, they need answered. And so today we have um, our panelists, uh, two eminent um, ophthalmologists who specialize in pediatric care, and so we're going to be doing an intro. And so this is recording what this in progress today. Today, and so and today, so today we're going to be um, having on Professor Adedayo Adio as well as Professor Nasiri Muhammad. Um, I'm just going to give a brief, very, very, very brief intro, summarized, you know, these are juggernauts in the field. So it was um, a huge task to compress their uh, CVs to what I'm giving you today. So I introduce to you Professor Adedayo Adio. Um, she's a professor of ophthalmology and a consultant in pediatric ophthalmology. Um, she attained her um, basic medical degree from the University of Illori Medical School over 30 years ago, closer to three and a half decades. And also the specialized fellowships made her an ophthalmologist well over 20 years ago, both the West African and the Nigerian fellowships. And um, she subsequently has had a wide range of experience of work in different places, Mercy Eye Hospital in Akwa Ibom, and then was appointed a consultant in ophthalmology by the University of Potaka Teaching Hospital way back 20 years ago, and that is where she is, still is right now. She attained a long-term fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology, sub-specializing in pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus, and neuro-ophthalmology at the prestigious LV Prasad Eye Institute in India way back in 2014. She is currently head of um, Pediatric Eye Care Service at the University of Potaka Teaching Hospital. She also has the um, ROP screening team. That is a team that screens premature babies for eye problems. And she coordinates the low vision um, course. Uh, she's done that in Potaka since 2017. She also coordinates autoptics training, which is another specialized part of um, pediatric ophthalmology. And she's um, been a past residency training director. That's for people being trained to be specialists, to be ophthalmologists. She's also been a past head of department in the same um, hospital. And she's the immediate past chairman of NIPOS. NIPOS is Nigerian Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Society. That's a collection of specialized eye, pediatric eye specialized ophthalmologists in Nigeria. She's on the scientific board and ethics committee of the World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. She's a volunteer ophthalmologist at the Lens Rehabilitation, uh, Rehabilitation Foundation for the Blind and Visually Impaired, also known as TILEC in Nigeria, that's in Port Harcourt. This is where um, teenage boys and girls are rehabilitated to fully integrate back into society in an inclusive and useful manner. And she's been an author of several publications in local and international journals, and she's herself a journal reviewer. So she's really a giant in the field of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. We welcome her. The second person on the panel is Professor Nasir Muhammad, also a professor of ophthalmology and consultant in pediatric ophthalmology. He attained his um, MBBS basic medical degree 20 years ago from the Usman Danfodio University. And he has since then had um, specialization into ophthalmology, um, 2002 with a diploma followed by a fellowship. And then, you know, also diplomas outside of medicine, public administration and education, and a master's from the London School of um, Tropical Health and Hygiene in 2016. He is uh, currently a professor of ophthalmology, um, at the Usman Danfodio Hospital. Um, he's also an honorary consultant um, at uh, the same hospital's uh, teaching facility. He's had a long working experience in um, ophthalmology for Sokoto, Kanu, Kaduna, the Gambia, Saudi Arabia for well over 20 years. He's been a past chairman of the Nigeria Medical Association in Kebi State. He's also been chief resident when he was a trainee at the National Eye Center, that was in 2006, and head of ophthalmology of uh, University of uh, the Dafodio University Teaching Hospital in Sokoto. He's been chairman MDCAN, that's the Association of Consultants in the same hospital. And up to, from 2018 to date, he's been the um, Medical Advisory um, uh, Committee Director of Training and Research at the same teaching hospital. He's been sec he's secretary board of trustees of the Anai Care Foundation, also a member of the technical team involved in um, child eye health, 
and also um, the Nigerian National you know, Task Force for the Federal Ministry of Health. He has authored several publications, both in local and international journals. And so today, I give you our experts, Professor Adedai Adil and Professor Nasri Mohammed. They're both very welcome. We thank you for making time within your extremely busy schedules and on a day that should be a rest day. And so thank you for making time for our question and answer session. And I welcome everybody to this, um, what promises to be a useful and stimulating um, session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Halima, for inviting us and uh, wish you all have a uh, a productive and enlightened session. So um, the format will be for me to, um, thank you, Professor Adio is on as well, ma'am. Professor Adio. Can you hear me, ma? I can hear you. Yes, thank you very much. So, um, so we're set to start. We already sent forms out, which um, we, we have questions already. And so I will um, allot questions and then I'll just read out the question and then I'll just say who it is who will answer this question. So this will be the format. Um, I will start with you, ma'am, Professor Adil. So I have a question that says that a four-year-old has had a red and itchy eyes for the last one year. It's worse in the dry season and the beginning of the rainy season. And he, although he's using eye drops, this person says it hasn't cleared. What should this person do? I will lump that with another question that is related that says, if my child starts to scratch her eyes, should I immediately take her to see an ophthalmologist? So Prof Ma, go ahead, please. Hey, thank you for inviting me for this um, great initiative. Uh, I think it's a very good one to allow um, parents and uh, friends and those who have people that could have eye problems be able to interact with the professionals. So going straight to the question, you said the four-year-old has a red and itchy eye. And uh, usually this kind of uh, um, period, when we have the rainy seasons, at least where I live, um, the problem is a little bit worse. And uh, if you are using eye drops from a hospital, which is recommended by the way, you are expected to go back for a checkup. Um, but this question says it has not yet cleared. Generally, the eye drops that are given, if you go to see um, an eye specialist, particularly a pediatric ophthalmologist, or someone who has been working with children for quite a while, they usually they'll give you some medication that will uh, reduce the body's sensitivity to um, uh, the allergen. Most of the time when these kind of things happen it's because the body is responding or reacting to some allergen in the environment. And um, when this happens, especially those who are prone to it, their eyes begin to itch and their eyes begin to have issues. So when this uh, doesn't work, then you have to go back to the doctor and explain. And then there are signs that will indicate for them to give some stronger medicine. Uh, this child is reacting to something. If you find out, if you can find out exactly what the child is reacting to, um, then you may not even need any medication. But if you don't know what it is, the best is just to allow the, the recognized eye professional uh, have a look, examine your child, and uh, make sure you're on the right medication. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mom. And so uh, the next question will go to Professor Muhammad. And so I have a question here that says, a newborn child developed redness in one eye by the third day after birth. Then the lead in that same eye got swollen for a week. And although the hospital gave some injections, um, not an eye hospital, the person admits, the color of the eye changed. And then the eye seems to be getting smaller. And so this person is wondering what's going on and what to do. Professor. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, uh, basically, what to do is really to go to the hospital, specifically to an eye clinic, to see an ophthalmologist. Now, looking at the scenario, uh, presentation of a red eye three days after birth, 
is what we, we call an infection in a neonate. It's a form of uh, conjunctivitis. Now, by the time the eyelid gets involved, then it means the infection is already spreading into the, uh, the muzzle, the skin, around the eye. And that is an indication of getting more serious. Um, the, 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 this eye getting smaller might not necessarily be the eye is getting smaller. Usually when the, the eyelids around the eye get swollen, the eyeball will appear as if it's getting smaller. So I, I want to encourage whoever asked that question to immediately take that child to an ophthalmologist to take a look. It, it is something that can be pretty serious because infection around that part of the body easily gets to the brain. And if it gets to the brain, it gets more serious. So I really ask whoever sent this question to quickly take that child to the hospital. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Um, so Professor Adio will be on again. So I have a question that asks, what, at what age should a child start getting the eyes checked? And a similar question says, how often should my child get an eye checkup, whether he or she has an eye problem or not? And yet another question says, what, are, what age should a child start screening their eyes? So, yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, I think I'll take them one by one. You said the first, say that again. I think I should- You want to know at what one. age a child should start screening their eyes? Okay, um, when the child is, uh, before the child even goes home from the hospital, is the first time that the child should be checked by the doctors, um, uh, especially if before they, um, uh, they are born and they have been cleaned and everything. Before the child goes home, they should not focus only on the mother. And then there are some obvious things that people may not notice in the child in terms of the color, the size of the eye, okay? If there's any reflex or appearance that is not very clear to, the, uh, to anyone, must be properly checked. And then when they go for their BCG examination or injections also, um, there should be, they should go, they should be looked at at least briefly and be seen. And generally there should be some kind of person that is available there to do what we call a red reflex, looking for uh, signs of where there's something that is blocking the vision in the two eyes. Uh, the two eyes should be straight, and uh, this child should not have any kind of reflex or this one's eye bigger than the other. Now, when the child is now, having done all that, when the child is now three years old or about to start school, should have another eye check. And then when the child is six, should have, to have an eye check. Specifically when they're getting to secondary school, when they're moving from GS3 to SS1, and when they're going to university. They should have their eyes checked reading this. And of course, more often, if they have an eye problem, they must be checked. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. I, I think you, you've actually you've actually answered with that. You've answered all the questions, the soft questions under that. Thank you. Okay, so Prof, sir, okay. you're back on again. Um, someone wants to know how do you prevent and treat discharge from the eyes of a newborn? A newborn. Prevention and treatment of discharge from the eye. Um, the, 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 the standard thing, any child at birth need to have the eye assessed, at least by the people that receive that delivery. So if uh, that assessment is done at that point, it's a good time to observe if there is any potential problem and that are including an infection. Please apologies for the background noise uh, in an airport. So these are some of the critical things that are expected in a functional health system. Any new child needs to be assessed. Now, usually there is what we call a prophylaxis using uh, a tetracycline eye ointment, for example, that is available even at primary health centers because it's, it's on the list of essential health medicines in this country. So it's expected to be available in virtually every health center. So that's one quick 
thing that could be done. Now, as for the treatment, this is uh, this has to be done by a health professional, depending on because they, they, there are lots of different discharges that they can be recoiled. It could be really prank force. So all this will determine what choice of treatment the health professional will take decision on. This is it's not recommended for anyone to just think he or she knows an eye drop or any medication and start applying, especially on a newborn child. So prevention to tricycline, it's, it's, it's something expected at primary health level and any subsequent treatment need to be done by preferably an eye health worker. Right. And then uh, I think the additional thing is antenatal care because some of these infections are acquired through the birth canal during delivery. So mothers attending antenatal care, getting their swabs taken, especially approaching delivery, just to show if there is any infection along the birth canal, this is managed and the whole spread of that infection during birth is prevented. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, I think that answered the question nicely. Okay, so Prof, ma'am, you're back on again. Um, so I have a question that says, how can I detect if my child has an eye problem without it being obvious? How can I tell if it's not obvious? Okay, um, if your child is moving so close to an object or the reading material or moves close to the television every time, and your child keeps rubbing the eyes, keep rubbing the eyes. These are all signs of eye problems. The eyes may not look problematic initially, but these are all signs. And if the eyes are crossed, maybe it's changing from one to the other. And it's maybe just a few times when the child is tired, when the child is angry, when the child is sleepy, or you know, or just waking up from sleep, the eyes are not straight, uh, then become straight after a while. So those kind of problems. Uh, when they're not able to focus. Uh, then when sometimes when there's a slight, you know, um, one lead, eyelid is a little bit droopy compared to the other. Sometimes it may not be very obvious, but these are all signs that there's a problem. Um, when one eye seems to bulge, you know, than the other is pushing out or slightly bigger than the other, these are all signs that there's a, a, there's a problem with the eye. Another one is when the child does not have any interest in reading. When the child... You know, when you just something to read and then just doesn't want to look at it, or he's looking away, or when he's when he's in class, you can't even see any notes that this child has written down, and the teacher is complaining that he doesn't pay attention. There may be an eye problem, or he's not doing well in school. These are all signs. Before you label that child as a dollar, you should have that child's eye checked. And when they're in the sun, sometimes they are squinting one eye. So all these things. And then sometimes when the child is in, uh, maybe in, the, in the night, seems to be bumping into things, bumping into objects, or even during the day, it's bumping into things, you know? That's a sign that these are all things that you need to talk about. Yeah. OK. Thank you, ma'am. And ma'am, you're still going to answer another question, which asks, what lifestyle changes do you suggest to help best manage a child's vision? What should they be doing more or less of? Okay. Um, you know, 80% of what children learn is from the eyes. And uh, so that is the reason why we have to be very careful with vision, especially in children. And you know, there are future. And if something happens and something quite drastic goes wrong with their vision, you can you will notice uh, to take, you know, they, will, they live a much longer life, you know. And if um, um, the care is not taken, you might have a challenge. So um, exposing them to digital devices and uh, making them to always look at things that are close, not utilizing distance vision, using more of near vision all the time, not allowing them to play. These are all things that they should do. Now, when, you know, when, like some of my patients, they will say, ah, uh, when you tell them that they should not allow them to study beyond three or four or two or three hours in a day, they are very happy, you know? But it, this is a, these are very important things. Excessive study is not good for a child. Screen time, excessive screen time is not good 
for a child. And you might note that if an, a toddler or an infant should not even be exposed to any digital device at all. And even online, there are, you can check online and see uh, what screen time is for your own particular child to play outside, to play outside in the sun. These are all things that have been, you know, um, um, found to help a child develop normal vision. If you have exposed them to digital devices too early, they might not be able to, you know, they might develop vision problems that can be, give, actually give them problems uh, later in life. Things like myopia, short-sightedness, these are all things that can develop in a child. So lifestyle changes, reduce the screen time, reduce near work, allow them to play outside in the sun, and then make sure that they also interact and are not depend on digital devices all the time. Okay, okay. these are all like- Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, Professor Mohammed, um, you're back on. Someone asks, there are three questions that are sort of related. I'm going to run them together. One person says, what could be the cause of pus? Pus in the eyes and how can it be treated? Then another person asks, what is the cause of a child always having mucus in the eyes on waking up in the morning? And then the third one talks about reddish eyes and eyes with mucus. What could be the cause if this happens every two to three months? So I've lumped these three questions together because they're similar. All right, thank you very much, Dr. I think this question is mainly about uh, redness and mucus. From an eye. Um, basically, it, it always indicates an infection. Once you have some force on the eye, it indicates an infection. Now, for this one, every two to three months, you need to ask, is, is there tears constantly drooping from that eye? For example, problems around the eye can cause repeated persistent redness from time to time. For example, problems with the eyelashes can cause this, or the, the tears as we know it is, is water. It has a drainage site at the inner part of the eye. So if a child is born with that place being blocked, the child is likely to have persistent tears running down the cheek. And from time to time, that child will get some infection and the parent will notice large amount of discharge or pus coming out. So this, uh, this is one reason that, uh, are some reasons that could explain frequent discharge from an eye. Um, children with uh, this itching are also prone to repeated discharge from time. Like earlier, we answered a question re re relating to itching. Now, most itching, as you see it, it's, it's allergy. It's a form of allergy. So looking after that, it's, it's a disease that can be controlled, well controlled with good care and medications. So if, if you control this, you reduce the, the rate at which your child will be having frequent pus coming out of the eye. Somebody getting injury from anything can cause that. Using harmful medications can cause this. Or people using all this uh, uh, urine or, or, or saliva or breast milk, all these are problems that some communities practice that can predispose these children to red eyes, to infections. But basically you see any force, there is an infection. But most infections will not occur just like that. There is usually something that is bringing that jump or making that jump to be aggressive to cause a problem. So they are better avoided. And if you notice them, please seek health, help from a health facility where there is an eye clinic, preferably. Where there isn't, you, could, you should assess a health facility for appropriate uh, uh, assessment and treatment. OK. Thank you, sir. Um, so you're still going to answer another question, as you know, that says, to prevent infection after eye surgery, how long must my child stay off school? I, I, I know there are different types of surgery, so I want to go ahead and you know inject, what if it's a cataract surgery, which is an invasive one, how long is it safe for, for the child? I mean, how long does the child have to stay away from school just to prevent eye infection? All right, so um, basically for, for a cataract surgery in a child, 
uh, we are all mindful that this is a child. So the way we manage cataract surgery in a child is different from we manage it in an adult simply because of this knowledge that this is a child. This is someone you can give instruction, do, and the person will do, don't, and the person will don't. So we, we actually take extra caution during surgery in children to ensure these problems do not come about. So uh, a straightforward, uncomplicated surgery in, in one eye with the other eye seeing normally. I mean, I, I, I can see that child in two, three weeks, depending on the age, can, can actually go back and can continue school. For somebody much smaller, who even the parents at home have extreme difficulty controlling and managing, obviously will have to stay longer for a month or six weeks before one can uh, safely say it, it's okay to allow the child to be unsupervised. Because it's all about being supervised. And then many a time we have medications that have to be applied. Uh, at those two, three weeks is quite frequent, but from three weeks, usually it's, it's less frequent. So these are period that it's possible, but please always discuss it with the doctor managing your child to tell you that he or she thinks your child can resume school. Right, thank you, sir. Okay, so Prof Ma, you're back on. Um, someone asked, what could be the cause of yellowish or reddish eyes in a 13 year old? I think that's two different colors. I don't know why they're lumped together, but that's the question. Yellowish or reddish eyes, 13 year old. Okay, um, someone who has yellowish eyes usually indicates that there's a problem with uh, the liver and that needs to be checked out by a professional. Sometimes when the bilirubin levels, which are part of the waste products in the liver, is too high, then you can have um, the bilirubin, which looks yellow or stains tissues yellow. You can have it staining the eyes and the face yellow, and then it goes down into the rest of the body. So somebody who has yellowish eyes definitely may have a serious condition and needs to be evaluated by the physician. So that is very important. Um, that, there's nothing to say a, a teenager cannot have uh, liver problems. So such a person is not a local problem, especially if it is involving both eyes. If it is involving just one eye, it's possible that there may have been some kind of injury to that eye and there was some blood that accumulated locally, which is breaking down. And part of the breakdown products is this uh, the it turns yellow, makes the white tissues in the eye turn yellow. Another condition we would consider benign um, in, that could cause the eyes to be yellow is when the child may have malaria. If a child has malaria, there could be some slight staining of the tissues of the eye as, as yellow. Of course, a sickler also could have yellow eyes from not having uh, blood properly. So, Definitely all this out by physician. Back to you, Ali. Okay, thank you, Ma. And Hello? Yes, yes, can you still hear me, Ma? What about the red one, the reddish eyes? If the eyes are reddish, what are the options for okay. what to be Okay, if the eyes are red, it could be a sign of trauma, which is part of the answer. I said sometimes if there's a direct heat to the eye, some blood, can uh, can you know can take can show and then it can break down. Then some other areas, especially if it's uniformly red, um, is red well, an infection. And I think uh, Professor Muhammad has handled that. An infection can happen to anyone. And of course, there are some types of infection that can happen. In, um, um, affectation of the eyes that can turn the eye red from an affectation of with the tissues within the eye. And if it's associated with problems with um, light, light sensitivity and some reduction in vision, you really, really need to see an eye doctor. You can't just stay at home. Any kind of redness must be attended to by an eye doctor. So just make sure that person sees an eye doctor. That could be a local problem. Uh, that's, when I say local, uh, around the eyes. And so that needs to be attended to uh, very, very seriously by an eye doctor. 
don't treat yourself at home. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so Prof. Prof. Muhammad, um, someone asks, a child who doesn't see well at night, could that be called night blindness? This is the whole extent of the question. Maybe you want to just elucidate on this. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, it's night blindness. Somebody who doesn't see well at night, is, that's what night blindness is all about. Now, the question is, what could cause it? Now, the, the, there are preventable cause, there is a treatable cause, and there, there are causes that uh, there isn't much treatment for that poor vision at night uh, based on the cause. Now, generally, vitamin A deficiency is, is the commonest problem that uh, you, you find at, uh, that can affect a larger number of children, for example. And just having uh, a balanced nutrition that includes uh, simple things like carrots, eggs, fish, meat, liver. These are vitamin A rich foods, uh, vegetables, just some home gardening things, not, not so complicated. Having them and your child is taking them gets adequate vitamin A to prevent that night blindness. Now in the case the person has a deficiency state, then that person's uh, night vision can be affected. This is basically because vitamin A is important to all of us to see clearly at night. So if, if your body is not having enough, so those mechanisms in us that enable us to see at night are ineffective, are not able to, to assist you to see well. So just treating that person with vitamin A will restore that problem. And so that the body has enough to do all the processing it needs to do that is adequate in store for that. Now there, there are other diseases that sometimes run in families that children can be born with, or sometimes uh, a, a problem affect the woman in pregnancy and, and the light sensitive part of the inside the eye gets affected. And that child right from a tender age will have poor night vision. And uh, unfortunately, at this point, there, there is no tentative treatment. There's, there's, there's a lot of research going on to find uh, uh, solutions for this, but it's, at best, it's still uh, at a uh, research level. There are some trials, but uh, it's not yet something that is available for someone to just go and, and have. So essentially, it is it's preventable. There are forms that are treatable and there is a form that the person just needs to be adopt, uh, adapted to how he or she functions at night. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like you to clarify regarding vitamin A. Um, some people have the habit of just going randomly to the chemist or the pharmacies and just buy vitamin A to use randomly. Is this advice? When you talk about vitamin A, are they supposed to go to hospital and get particular dosaging? Or should they form the habit of just randomly taking vitamin A, considering that it's a fat-soluble vitamin? I just want you to comment on that, sir. Yeah, it's, it's extremely important, really. Now, I mentioned prevention. If For, for many of us, we're aware that in, in, in the immunization schedule, they have this vitamin A supplementation. Now, that is a preventive effort because some people are not able to take those foods that I mentioned earlier due to their own peculiar circumstances. So there's a, a large availability of supplementation to enable children have adequate stock of vitamin A. Now in a, in a deficiency state, it's also a different dosing. Now this vitamin A that we see, it, it can actually kill. If you abuse vitamin A, it can kill. So people need to know that uh, yes, you can use vitamin A to treat it where you need to get to the hospital. They will give you a clear schedule of how that dosing is done. Because sincerely, that vitamin A, you see, you may just give it and you just see the person going into coma. You lose consciousness. So it's not a drug to just play around. Thank you for raising that up. Thank you, sir. So, um, Professor Adio, um, someone says, my child is an albino and always reads with the right eye. What is the cause and what's the way forward? Oh, 
Okay, people with albinism usually have, um, they, are higher risk, they are at a higher risk of developing problems with their vision because of this lack of pigment. You know, when you look at them, they're a bit fairer. In fact, it's not just fair, they're a bit almost, their skin is like, there's no pigment at all. There's no blackness at all. I know there are also European albinos also, you know, there are also American albinos that were already white and they're already, they are also albinos. So it's not just in black people. You know that from the color of their hair, completely white, you know? So uh, because of this lack of pigments, you know, when they are being formed as a baby in utero and also through infancy, they, this lack of pigment prevents their eyes from developing normally. And this is the crux of the problems that they have. They, they are, the, the wires of, from, I mean, from the eye to the brain, it is not wired properly because pigment is, in, um, is really needed in making sure that this wiring is successfully you know, laid down, so to speak. So if that is problematic, they will not be able to have um, good vision. So common problems that they could have is light sensitivity, what we call photophobia. They could also have refractive errors, like astigmatism, that is when the shape of the eyes are not particularly you know, um, equal, instead of it being a smooth sphere, it's uh, more curved on, on one area. There's also may have short-sightedness, hyperopia, that's long-sightedness, and then they could also have problems with color vision itself. And so all this combination of problems, in addition to the fact that the eyes are not properly developed, there's an area of the eye called the macula, which may not be properly developed in these people. So they could have what we call low vision. And such people usually need to have special glasses and assisted vision using devices, what we call low vision aids. And uh, sometimes, you know, if, if they don't know that they need all this, they usually suffer through school and uh, even in interacting, going out in the sun, they, they suffer from the photophobia, the excessive sun that is entering their eyes unrestricted. There's this part of the eye called the pupil that we have, those who are pigmented, that blocks excessive light. It gets smaller, then it filters off excessive light. It gets wider, it allows light to come in. But in them, their iris is the pupil, is not pigmented. So it just allows light to enter unfettered, unfiltered, you know? So when this happens to them, they really suffer a lot. And so that is not one of the reasons why they have that. So somebody could have albinism and be seen very well only with one eye, depending on how well the vision is. So such a person should be supported by an eye doctor. A parent has to take that child to see an eye doctor. And when that eye doctor sees the patient, they are properly or thoroughly examined. Maybe the that they could Thank have. And that other problems that they could have also in terms of color vision problems, in terms of the type of glasses power that they could have, in terms of the photophobia, combating it. So in, in the, once they, all this is taken care of, and uh, they also see a low vision specialist, usually they will have a better time. Apart from the other problems that they could have with the skin, these are the problems that they could have with their vision. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. So there's a follow-up question about when a child totally loses vision or a young person. Um, because I know that you, you know, you're specialized in that aspect of life. I, I need you to tell people what happens when a child's vision is so low, too low for any of these devices to really be of help, you know, any longer with conventional education or the way we know it. So what, what would you be your advice for such a group of people? How can they get help? and you know, where. Okay, um, it's very important for us to note that um, everything is not just all about uh, uh, vision, perfect vision. If that child is not able to uh, use the vision or the vision is not yet, is not used, is not very useful. After trying every possible means, seeing a specialist, they've checked that it's not a surgical problem, it's not an optical problem, it's not a medical problem, and they've taken all the steps and still the vision is too low to function in class, then what the child should have is to have what we call vision rehabilitation. You should not keep that child in a school and be pushing them from class to class without being properly schooled in the methods of um, accessing information without depending on vision. 
If you do that, you're not helping that child. If that child needs to now do public exams, it's, that's where the child will now stop because they, the, the child does not have the means to access those public exams. And of course, they will not allow you to get the brother or the sister to come and start doing the exam for the person, you know? So what you are expected to do is allow the child to have at least a year or two of vision rehabilitation and they will be schooled in the methods of using assistive devices. It will interest you to know that there are a lot of things like text, converting text to speech, that is softwares that the children can use so that they can also hear, especially they have, don't have any hearing problems. They can hear this, whatever it is, information you want to give. And they can also give you information back on their own by um, typing out the answers to any question that is given to them. So learning all, we're not learning all this. So any child who has low vision that is too low to be able to um, uh, access, the, you know what I mean, get better with device or does not have any vision at all, whether it was born, his child was born like that or he becomes um, like that, he should have um, rehabilitation. Anybody less than 10 should have that. And anybody older than 10 should have one year, um, less than 10, two years, so that they are properly schooled in giving all this, uh, in giving information and accessing information. After that, this child can now go to school with other children who are sighted. That is the world, uh, that's the international recommendation. They should not be kept in a blind school. Children who cannot see should not be kept in a blind school just because they cannot see for the whole of their educational year. That is not fair. That is like, like, like um, uh, excluding them from relating with other people. Okay, now what happens when they now finish their education? They now have to interact. They are, you have spent most, you have kept them away for most of the important part of their learning years or formative years away from other people. So the internet, if you see a blind school outside this country now or in all these other places, they are for just a resource center. So once, once they learn how to, get this information. They put them in, in schools, we call inclusive schools, where they learn alongside those who are cited with a special education teacher to make sure that they are following the methods that have been taught. That's what they should do. So you shouldn't be afraid. If you have a child that has that problem, it's not the end of you might be surprised that this child may even do better than any of your cited children. So don't worry, we have the means to do that. Dr. Alimi can connect us. If you're around us here, we are in Port Harcourt here, TNEC Rehabilitation Center. We can do that for you. And we also help those who also become blind later in life. Maybe they've acquired a degree or they are doing their masters. Anyone that loses vision, we also help people like that to get back on their feet. So um, if you have any questions, if you have any comments or anything that you want to, any questions that you have, just contact us through Dr. Ali Mishimi, how to get to us connected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you very much for that response. Um, I, I believe I have one more question left. Um, so, and that will go to Professor Mohammed. Um, you sort of answered it already, sir, but you know, just because it's been asked, um, it's still the same question about um, having discharge and puff uh, in a child living with hydrocephalus. I don't think it's any different from any other person, but you know, it's been asked. So I'm going to put the question to you that a child living with hydro hydrocephalus has a watery discharge and puff. What should they do? So like, like we mentioned earlier, once you have pus, just know that it's an infection. If you have just tearing without a pus, it's not likely to be an infection. But once you have pus, there is an infection and it needs to be treated. So you need to get to an eye clinic. They will assess, you know, pus is of different type. You can have a pus that is just mucus, you have a, a, some discharge that is a mixture of real pus and mucus. You can have a discharge that is just pus. And sincerely, like that pus is an emergency. For that kind of pus can destroy the eye within hours. So you need to get to the hospital. The specialist will assess the type of pus that child has. And, and manage it. It, it, it. It's not different, like, uh, as you said, from any other 
child without hydrocephalus. It's, it's an infection and it's something that can be treated and get rid of. Thank you very much, sir. I want to say a big thank you to both Professor Adil and Professor Mohammed for this um, unique opportunity to interact with people um, on this platform. Um, thank you, both of you. Um, we would like to wrap up by taking five or seven minutes to just talk about the Restore Foundation just for everybody's um, education about what we do and what we're about. And so um, in a moment, I, I, can, I, I think you can all see my screen. Yes, um, so I'll share in a moment. Right, okay. So the Resource Foundation for Child Science is it's a non-profit, uh, non-governmental um, outfit. Just a moment, yes a political, a religious health advocacy and intervention organization with advanced treatment and education, primarily focused on blindness and visual impairment in children. And we serve as a facilitator for care. Now, um, our vision is to ensure attainment of full life potentials through optimizing the eyesight in disadvantaged children. And in, to that, um, in that direction, we're on a mission to restore and improve vision and ocular alignment in children. Our core values uh, around empathy, respect, dedication, quality service, and we are dogged about results. And we, are, we stand on the fulcrum of education and training, advocacy, as well as intervention, both at community and at clinical level. As part of our training and education activities, um, for the last 16 months, we have carried out free teacher training in vision screening for school children, so that these teachers are kitted with the ability to detect children with um, low vision and less than normal vision and direct them for care to wherever they need to go. So it, we've, treat, we've directly trained 848 teachers in this respect from about 389 schools, and it's still on, you know, it's ongoing throughout the year. Um, under the auspices of different organizations, we've treated under National Association of Proprietors of Private Schools and many others, and we're still in the process of trying to recruit other groups into these activities. So this is just a pictorial depiction of some of the sessions we've had, teacher training, we gather teachers, we give them a presentation about eye care, and then we break up into practical groups where we practicalize everything, we make them um, you know, carry out this test for themselves. So in so doing, they are kitted with the ability to test children and refer them to wherever they need to get help. We have community intervention programs. Um, in Makoko, the first one we did was in May last year, where we saw 1,700 children over a period of five days. So deliberately, we go to underserved areas, areas that have no healthcare facilities and have difficult access in and out. And um, this is kind of area that we love to go to. So this is an overview of Makoko. You know, it's um, a community that we have to get through via a canoe. Um, so this is it, just different pictorial depictions of what we've done. So we examine them and we treat on the spot. So we give drugs to those who need drugs, we give glasses to those who need glasses, and then we schedule those who need surgeries for surgery. The next one was in November 2022, and this was um, a Boi community in Ketu. Again, over four days, 790 children. Again, this is our entryway into the community, only one way, which is across the water. And then this is just, again, pictorial depictions, a few pictures from some of what we've done. Uh, Ebutemeta was the first program this year, community intervention, that was in February where we saw over 1,000 children, by 1,170 over, again, another four-day period. And so, again, we're just bringing to you pictures of some of the, you know, activities. Yes. Right. And then, again, um, we're in Ikorodu, Ikorodu, the Owutu Ishao Axis, um, May this year, 1,700 children seen. And, again, vision testing, waiting for examination, examination with tools that we need, and then eye drops for those who need it, spectacles delivered later for those who need it, surgery scheduled. Again, Ikorodu is a huge community. So again, last month, or oh, well, early this month, we're still in July, early this month, we were in Ikorodu, the Adamo, Okoito, and then Imota Axis. We saw 766 children over a three-day period. And again, we go through the same process of vision testing them, examining them, and then we give out whatever treatments they need. And so this is what we've been up to. Um, we also undertake eye care for specific groups that we see are disadvantaged. We've mentioned children with albinism today, 
And so last year, we had a program specifically directed for children with albinism, where we again, visual tested them, refracted them, and we gave them all the glasses and visual um, devices that they needed. And what we've done is to leave our door open for the, the, the narrative that any child with albinism, we owe them that first examination and pair of glasses free of charge. And so um, between May last year and this year, we've seen almost 200 you know, of, of children and, and giving them um, assistive care with um, um, optical devices and spectacles. We also have eye care programs taking place in orphanages. And so the objective of this is to provide high quality vision testing and examinations of children in orphanages and homes, because we know they're vulnerable. Some of them are abused children. And they don't have anyone else to care for them in this direction. And so we provide free medications, free glasses or optical devices and any sight restoring surgeries we need to do, we do this for them free of charge in orphanages. And we train all the orphanage staff again in vision screening and we leave them with free vision testing kits just as we do for the schools, you know, just so that they can continue to carry out, they have a policy to screen the children and new children as well coming in. And so they establish regular testing and then we continue to open our doors for any children from orphanages to get free treatment, whatever they need. In the last 15 weeks, since we started this, we've examined 470 children in 23 orphanages and examined 161 of their staff. And so we've given out free of charge 212 drops of, you know, eye drops or ointments, um, 72 pairs of glasses, and 65 pairs of readers for the staff. We've already done six surgeries, five cataracts and a screen surgery. This is all done free of charge in service to these communities. We barely scratched the surface. We still have a long road, 72 orphanages to go before we're done seeing the orphanages registered in Lagos State. So we're on a roll and we're still on the task. We also have, just as an example of some of the clinical interventions, we, this is cataract surgery before and after, completely different people, same person, but two different facial expressions. Um, and then screen surgery, lots of these. So this is just an example. And then amblyopia surgery, um, amblyopia therapy, where we try to you know, um, improve the level of vision in a one disadvantaged eye. And we also have education activities so public webinars such as these we've undertaken since early last year. The first one was about cataracts in children. And then the next one was about premature babies and the problems that they have with their retina. And then we talked about short-sightedness in children as it relates to screen time. And then we also talked about general use of spectacles in children. Um, early this year, the first one talked about retinoblastoma, which is a cancer in the eye, very important to know about. And then this is today where we've um, had this unique Q&A session with this um, astounding panelists to, um, um, to talk to two people. Now, um, just as a summary, our vision restoration journey has been on for 21 months. And in that time, we've given out almost 4,000 free eye, um, eye drops and medications. We've um, direct, directly trained 848 teachers in vision screening for school children. Um, we've given out um, 696 pairs of eyeglasses and we've undertaken 114 um, uh, eye surgeries. And so this is what we've done. And we're poised to do more. Our job is not by any means done. We've barely scratched the surface. So we ask everyone to join us and support us in any way that they can. Right, so um, we, can, we can check out our website, www.resourcefoundationng.org. We can be reached on our um, Gmail, you know, as shown the address, also called on 90 and we have a Facebook and Instagram handle as well. So thank you for your time. You know, thank you everyone for, for coming to this um, all important um, program. Right, so thank you so much. I'd like to end this by saying a hearty thank you to the two profs, Professor Muhammad, Professor Adio, who have so kindly made our time for this important session. Um, thank you so much. And we hope that um, you will oblige us whenever we call on you again. And I'd also like to thank the audience for being there. And we want to say that we're streaming live on YouTube. So we hope that we can send out these recordings to anyone who wants it, because we want the message to get to as wide as aud an audience as we can reach. So thank you everyone, both panelists and the audience for being here. Thank you, Prof. Adieu. Thank you, Prof. Mohammed. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Hour.
Thank you so, so much. We're grateful. Wish everyone you. well. All right. So All right. Bye-bye. Wish everyone a nice Thank day. You. Enjoy the rest of your day. And please watch out for the next um, webinar, which might come up in a couple of months or three months. Thank you, everyone. And bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.